thank you everyone so much for coming. This is the most exciting forum every semester is our showcase forum where we get to hear about cool things that are happening in the college um, from our instructional faculty and other folks teaching. So first we're going to start off today with Ben Farman, who's going to tell us about standards-based grading that he's been implementing in his statics course. And then we're going to transition to Kyle Johnson and um, AJ, who is an undergraduate student working with Kyle to talk about a cool VR um, innovation that they are implementing uh, this semester for some educational research. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Ben. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm really glad I'm going first because I don't wanna have to follow the virtual reality talk. But um, <laughs> so I, I'm gonna tell you about standard-based grading, which is uh, often called mastery-based grading. And it's, um, I just started implementing it last fall. So this is new to me, but I've got some results to show you. Go ahead, next slide. And, but I first wanna tell you that my, my motivation for doing this, right? It's a lot easier not to change than it is to change. And I thought this was a change worth making, uh, basically because I was really dissatisfied with the traditional system. Uh, percentages are not used in industry like this to grade somebody's work, right? And I think we should try to be more like industry. There's somebody at the door if anybody wants to look. And then, um, I get really annoyed by grade grubbing and I think it completely misses the point, right? They're just arguing for a few more points rather than trying to learn the material. I am convinced that the percentage grade doesn't really have much of a meaning at the end of the day. I'm happy to talk more about that, but I'll leave that there for now. And I think the connections between what we're testing and what we're trying to get our students to learn could be more explicit. So I'm going to try to call it standard-based grading. Again, it was traditionally called mastery-based grading. That's been changed because it's seen as problematic. Uh, and it can take many, many forms. I'm just going to show you one of these forms. But I think from what I hear, you have to have all three of these components to call it standards-based grading or mastery-based grading. You have to have clear learning targets. You have to be assessing students' mastery and that eventual mastery matters. So you don't have to show that you understand it immediately, but by the end, you, you should know. So, so there's sort of some uh, retaking involved. Go ahead. So the first thing I had to do was take what I had as student learning outcomes and turn them into learning targets, right? I need to make these clear learning targets for my students. They get this in the syllabus. They know it all semester. They, we'll talk more about these in detail, but there are 13 learning out, uh, learning targets in total. Um, and there's sort of an outcome achievable for each one of these. We'll get to more of that later. Next slide. So, and again, we are assessing mastery here. So there's one exam per learning target that you just saw. Every exam is pass fail. Exam sounds a little more intimidating than it should. Uh, these are 25 minutes in class assessments where they're just given a problem and asked to show that they understand the process that I'm testing them on. Uh, a pass means that they demonstrate a mastery. Of, I don't even call it a fail. It's just uh, you didn't pass yet. You have a chance to retake there. They're, and this is where the eventual mastery matters. Students can retake failed exams. It's a new problem. It can't be the same problem. They have to get a brand new problem. It's the same process that I'm asking them to do. It's a very limited basis though. They, there's no unlimited uh, retakes. Some people using mastery-based or standards-based grading allow many, many retakes. I just don't think it's feasible. I don't wanna try to facilitate that. Hit the, uh, and one more. Uh, and then some exams count for other exams. So these first three exams, the first three learning targets here are basically the building blocks of all of the next four. You have to demonstrate that you know these on each of these four. So let's say a student fails all three of these. If they pass four or five or six or seven, they also get credit for those three, right? So there's sort of some double counting there. Um, that's just a way that I've found that I think is fair, right? There's no point in making them go back and, and do this specifically. They can show me that they understand this by passing any of these exams. Next slide. 
So these top 13 are the 13 exams that I'm giving. They're the, the outcomes or the, the things that I'm assessing in the, in the exams. They're what I expect static students to know when they leave. These last two are not exams. The, the par preparation, participation, practice, that's basically the day-to-day -day things that I think you have to do in statics to be successful. I, I teach a mostly flipped class, so there's a pre-class assignment every day. Participation in class is just playing along with your, your group mates and working together, and then practices submitting the homework. And then the group project is also graded in this pass-fail manner. I'll talk more about the exams in a minute, but for the group project, there are many submissions, uh, sort of in this progression where the first submission is just a uh, like a contract among the group members, and it's also uh, an outline for what they're proposing to analyze. The second one, and, and then they get feedback after that. The second submission is most of the analysis. It's, I would say, the hardest part of the analysis, and then they're going to get feedback after that. And then the third submission is where they are supposed to have all of the analysis completed. But if they have any error in that third submission, then I give them feedback and I say, this isn't good enough. You need to do something else or something different or something better, whatever. There's a lot of feedback involved. And then, uh, so, so there's sort of moving due dates. And I think this is more uh, representative of industry. We don't, I don't think we should just be collecting assignments and then whatever, assessing, assessing their grammar and whatnot, and then giving them a grade, right? We should be telling them when they've achieved something, when they've produced something that's good enough or when they haven't. Uh, that's really all I have to say about the group project. Get the next. Uh, so this is how we get to a final course grade. There are 15 total outcomes that you can get. If you get all 15 of them, you get an A. If you get 14, A minus, and so on. Uh, one, one issue that I, I thought this had, or one reason I was hesitant to do this, is that I thought it put all of these things on equal footing. They're not equal, right? These three are much easier, and honestly, they should know the first one before they ever come to class. It's just sort of a, an introduction into the system. They're not equal. Hit the next slide. I see these three, these three, and these two as, I mean, I don't present it like this in class. I see them as gimmies. They should be achievable relatively easily by everybody. If you pass all eight of those, you get a D, right? You have to demonstrate that you know how to perform a static analysis on two different exam or two different scenarios to pass the class. If you pass four, you get a B, you pass six, you get an A. If you pass all seven, you get, or sorry, six, you get an A minus, pass all seven, you get an A. So you still have to demonstrate that you know how to perform a static analysis to pass statics. Um, and I think this has a lot more meaning than the grades that I, were, that I was giving. I think with, the, uh, with partial credit and I didn't know how people were passing, you know, I like, if I really went back, I could find out, you know, they got so much partial credit on these assignments and somehow combined they got a, a C. I know exactly what they've passed and what they haven't with this system. And I think it has more meaning because of that. Uh, go ahead, next slide. So this is, I stole this system. Uh, this is how I'm giving grades. Grades, I'm not, I'm not even calling them grades. I'm calling them marks, right? They can get uh, E, S, P, or M. Those are the the when, when they submit a, an exam to me and I give it back, this is what they're getting. They're getting one of these letters. E means everything's good. S means you, you showed me that you know the process, but maybe there were some minor mistakes. Still good enough to pass, but some minor mistakes. P is you, you didn't pass. And N, nobody who showed up has ever gotten an N. If you don't come to class that day, you get an N, basically. So, so P, so somewhat euphemistically means progressing. It really just means not pass. It means that you, you haven't done enough. You need, to, you, need to, you need to do something different, right? Um, and rather than giving grades and having a lot of minus points here and there, 
I spend most of my time giving feedback on these exams rather than determining, determining what number they should get. And this is what I hated most about grading in the traditional system is that I just, I didn't think it meant anything. And I was trying to make it fair so that somebody's grade was higher or lower than somebody else's grade with the system. And rather than fighting all that, it's either good enough or it's not. You're gonna get feedback either way. And thankfully, the, the focus that the, the students focus is on the feedback. When they, you know, flip the page over and see the, the mark, their focus is on the ESPRN. But then even after that, they're looking at my feedback rather than, you know, there's no points. There's no points to look at. So it's all about feedback. The next slide. Um, so this is an example problem. Uh, go ahead and hit next slide again. This is just to zoom in on something that they've done. And obviously this isn't very much feedback, but the free body diagram looked good. They told me what they were gonna derive. They derived the equation correctly. They simplified it correctly. And then I don't know how they put this number when that was this number, that's not this number. This is correct, this is not. So they passed this exam, even though they gave me the wrong answer because they derived the right equation. I don't know what happened between here and here. These are right, this is wrong. I don't care that the answer is wrong. They gave me the right process. There are, there are more extreme examples. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any more uh, examples uh, photocopied to, to share, but there was one student last semester who, who almost every number she wrote down was wrong, but the, the numbers that she wrote down that I considered was the process were correct. And then something, she just transcribed those numbers and then really just, just committed to them, right? And just carried them all the way through. The process was right, all the numbers were wrong, she passed, right? You just have to show me that the process is correct. Go ahead, next slide. So this, this is, uh, like I said, some of these exams will, will, will double count, but also we have the opportunity to retake. The blue bars are, the first time passers for each of these 18 outcomes. The orange bars show how much that increases by allowing the retakes, right? So my argument here is that these orange bars, they knew how to do this eventually. They should not be punished or, or their grade should not be decreased because they didn't know it the first time I tested it. So yeah, these, these count just as good as if you pass it the first time. If you pass it the first time, you obviously don't have to take it again, but this is sort of the power of the retake. Um, and maybe I'll mention here as well, you notice that like exam five had a pass rate of like 24% or something initially. One outcome of this, one result of this is that everybody can pass or everybody can fail. You either, they meet the standard or they don't right? There's no curve. You don't have to be any better than your, your uh, classmates. You, you're, you're all individual and you're going against the material. You're just meeting the standard rather than competing against each other. I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Go ahead and next slide. So this was my final course grade distribution before I did this. Pretty decent bell curve, I guess. Uh, a lot of withdrawals that's, that's common in statics. D and F are considered failing grades. I did sort of squish these together because I have A's and A minuses, B, B plus and, and all those. And I just sort of put them together because the new system I'm using does not have those. Right now it's really just A, B, C, D, E, F. So this was what it was. Next slide. This is what it is now. So many more A's, right? This is very, I want to, you can call it, you know, skewed towards the A. I don't even want to call it skewed because this isn't a normal bell curve anymore, right? This is never meant to be a bell curve. This is any, I, I will give 100% A's if everybody passes, everybody demonstrates mastery. I'm happy to do that. I don't think that's going to happen, but I'm happy to do that. Uh, I would also fail everybody if nobody meets the standards. Um, so that's the sort of the, the shift from what I've done in the past. Hit the next slide one more time. Just as a comparison, don't look at this yet. Um, the, the GPA is about the same. It went up a little bit. Who knows if that's significant? I didn't check. Um, 
I went up a little bit with the standards based, mostly because this is my uh, fourth, fourth year here. This was data from last semester. I almost gave more A's last semester than I did in my first three years combined because they met the standards and I wasn't penalizing them for, for learning it later than, than not, not at the first. The DFW rate did not change much. It went up a little bit with this new system. I've only done it for one semester, so I, who knows where that'll land. Uh, but the, the drop fail withdrawal rate went up a little bit. I, I'm gonna, some, some, some feedback that I typically hear about this is that some people think that I'm somehow lessening the standard by doing this or lessening the rigor or the difficulty or something. I hesitate to do this, but I'm gonna use the DFW rate as proof that I'm not doing that. But now that I've said it, forget that I said it because I really wanna lower this number without reducing the, the rigor and the difficulty and all that. Um, a goal is to get that number as low as it can. That's pretty typical for, for statics nationwide. Yours is probably higher. <laughs> Yours is zero, they all pass? Yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, go ahead, next slide. Uh, so some of my thoughts on this, and I don't think I have data to back up much of any of this, but I think, you know, collaboration as it should be is a value of our college. I think collaboration is hugely important in education. And this system, I think, lends itself more to collaboration. You're not competing in any way. You're not trying to beat the curve. You're just trying to learn the material and teaching helping your your classmates learn the material could never have a negative impact on you it would only be positive uh i doubt i'll ever go back for statics for statics that's usually the first question people ask me is am i going to keep doing this i think i i think i will uh i think the pass fail system for exams is so much more like the real world than giving a percentage grade i have never turned in something to like a regulatory body or a supervisor or a, a client and they told me I got an 86, right? They're, it's either good enough or it's not. And I think this more closely matches that. This is one that I just realized while I was making this presentation. In I'll see they talk about backwards course design and, oh, I'm spending a lot more time than I meant. Um, they talk about backwards course design where it's basically you're, you're designing your entire course thinking about what, your, what you want your students to be able to do after having the course than they couldn't do beforehand, right? So, so you're not thinking about delivering content, you're thinking about how can I make, how can I help them grow as engineers? How can I uh, get them to master these things? Standards-based grading is more in line with that, uh, I would argue. I don't remember why. <laughs> I don't remember why. I'll, I'll, we'll talk about it if you want. But it's obvious. It's trivial. You know this. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it's you know, a direct line between your course objectives and how you That's right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I'm glad y'all were paying attention. Um, also, and I think this is huge. We got the E. The same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, when I return exams, students. I think it seems to me they interpret that as feedback rather than as a punishment. They're never, I mean, that's partly because even if they fail, they can retake the exam, right? Um, and it's just feedback to whether they're doing the right thing, the right things outside of class or not, right? Are they studying the right way? Are they preparing the right way? Uh, I don't think it's a punishment, but it is a reward. If you get an outcome, if you pass an exam, I will not take that away from you. There's nothing you can do to lose that. So there is a reward without a punishment. And again, my time is spent giving feedback, which I hope is more valuable than it is giving points. I spend less time grading now um, because I don't have to decide on a number. I don't have to decide on a percentage. I just, is it good enough or not? And give them some feedback to help them make it better. Even if they get an E, even if everything looks good, I might still give them feedback to help them improve. 
Uh, one more slide, please. This is some uh, uh, student responses from last semester. These top three are uh, for Dominic because I feel like he's implied a lot that I give too many exams. And this one said, I really like how the class was set up with 12 exams. Several small tests was helpful. So they don't mind having. <laughs> they, they, uh, they don't mind having near weekly exams. Uh, this person said the outcome system had the best possible grade, reinforcing knowledge, retakes were good. Pass fail structure was helpful. This guy hated me and the class. Uh, he said it should not be 100% or nothing. He never understood what I was trying to do. He also said that uh, my teaching style was ridiculous. Um, the, the tests are difficult, but fair. Retake opportunities are good. I designed the course with students in mind, multiple opportunities to learn. And this person thought it was confusing, but then very succinctly described the course. So I don't, I don't know if I believe that. Um, and that's, that's all I got. Go ahead and next slide. Are there any, any questions, comments, thoughts, anything at all? No. <laughs> if there's more, I'm happy to listen to it. But. No, different problems. And that was a big time sink last semester is I had to create a lot of exams. I'm reusing many of them while still adding to the exam pool right now. Um, that's, that is an issue that, that I didn't mention. It takes a lot of time to create exams. Kyle. The logistics of this uh, retake thing uh, seem problematic to me if you're thinking that you know, you've got X number of classes, right? Are you having them do the retakes in class? So yeah, the question is about logistics for the retakes. Um, the exams are in class, retakes are in class. And this is why I say that it's limited. Uh, there are three days in class scheduled for retakes. The final exam is retakes almost entirely. Probably a third of your class is spent doing the exams. So actually, uh, not quite. I should have mentioned this. The exams only take 25 minutes. So it's the first half of class will be an exam. Second half will be a, a, a short uh, lesson. And because it's flipped, I actually didn't remove any material. I just do the same amount and they just spend less time in class on it and more for them to do. Uh, I don't know if that's best, but uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't reduced the, number, the amount of material that I cover. Uh, I do spend a lot of time in, it, in class giving exams, but yeah, but not, not a third. Thanks. Yes. So, so I took my undergrad in Mexico. I have PhD US. And I thought retaking exams was a forbidden stuff in US. Because in Mexico, we actually do like that. And I was explaining to students the other day that, that you have the units with the exams, and then if you fail, you have another opportunity at the end of the semester. And then you, if you fail those, you then have another opportunity like yeah. at the end of every year. Yeah. Um, so, how is that? on the regulations with the institution and with the whole so one thing uh, so the question is that uh in some some places some cultures it's it's normal to have retakes and then in the u.s it seems not it seems pretty abnormal yeah, it, it was more on the curve yeah yeah and and then how does the institution feel about this one of the good things that came out of the pandemic is that they were very clear multiple times that i have complete control over how i do assessments in my class because that's the only thing we had control over for a year. And um, so, yeah. And, and I think this is in line with ABET because what ABET asked for is students who, uh, I can't remember the words that they used, but the students who performed well enough and the students who didn't, or it was satisfactory and unsatisfactory. So instead of finding a, a number grade that might match each of those, I just take a pass and fail. And that's what it is.
Yeah, and I would argue that uh, for my biggest concern on the retakes would be that we're training students that uh, just go ahead and do it. And even if you pre don't prepare for that first one, they know they have another opportunity because a lot of students in Mexico, they wouldn't do like that. They just like coast the whole semester and then at the end, they actually study for a week and they pass everything. Yeah. But then going back to you know, my check with the industry, that doesn't happen in the industry. Like yeah. you have your first time and if you fail it and many fails, it's like you're out of the company. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it might be a big concern that it actually doesn't align with the industry. Yeah, no, that's, that's very true. Um, and I actually had, I had a student last semester who I think by the time of the withdrawal deadline had passed three of the maybe nine exams we had given by that point. And he said, can I pass? And I said, theoretically, yes, but you're clearly not doing the right things. And he said, oh, so I just really got to get my shit together. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's all. And he did, he passed, he got an A. Because uh, he passed every exam after that, including five on the date of the final exam. I'll also, yeah, he, he did it in half a semester, basically. I'll also mention that uh, Sal Khan has talked about this, where, you know, let's say you have this series of, uh, I don't know, eight math courses starting in middle school through college. And if you get a 70% on each one in each course, supposedly that means you know 70% of the material and you're passing each course. But by the end of it, there's so much material that you don't know, right? And I guess that could still be true here. But um, at least there's more meaning behind the grade. Yeah. So um, we are uh, starting. We're getting close to the time for you to switch. Um, but I do want to, I'm sure Ben would be happy to talk about this individually if you have any questions. Yeah. Um, I'd like to end with the uh, final question from chat, which is how do you think this approach could transfer to other types of courses such as project based courses? I don't know. Yeah, I think I think it's. Uh, I mean, it took me a lot of time to figure out how to do it for this. So good luck. <laughs> uh, yeah, I will say that, like like I said, with the the group project that I do, I just have multiple deadlines, multiple checkpoints, a lot of feedback. Maybe something like that could work, but. I haven't even figured out how to do project-based learning without this. So I'm not gonna to try to figure out that and how to apply uh, standards-based. We don't have time <laughs> for that right now. We have time for one more question. I, my question is the same about the logistics, so okay. Yeah, and just as a comment, there are a lot of people who use this who give unlimited retakes and it's basically they allow it to happen in uh, office hours. I don't think that's fair because a lot of my students can't come to my office hours. Uh, also, these those courses were math courses where it's really easy to just sort of randomly generate problems. I cannot do that. It's very time consuming to create problems. So all retakes are scheduled in class. One of the things that I was, <clears throat> I was wondering is that the system might have an opportunity where the exam becomes more about learning than about demonstrating. And I wonder whether eventually that could lead to different types of exam problems. Like you described how you try to judge the thought process, right? But do traditional problems that do the nickel and diamond with numbers, do they necessarily are they the best for eliciting thought processes? That they could actually, if those students in those 25 minutes could also learn and deepen their understanding, could that lead to a shift of the types of problems? Yeah? I think so. I, I think that there could be great potential for learning with exams. When I've tried it in the past, I've found that students get so anxious during exams that their creativity shuts down, uh, any opportunity for learning shuts down. And even if they know they have plenty of time, they're rushed and they just, I, I, I don't know how to, to make that happen. And I, 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 but I do think it's possible. I think there's great potential. I wish I could find a way or hear of some way to do that. Um, do they become more, feel lower stakes later on? Like, I mean, if you found 13 of them, are, you, are they still as stressed? Yeah, the yeah, people, yeah. By the end of the semester, it's just like, <laughs> yeah, beginning of the semester when, when it's really easy, they are stressed 
out of their minds. And when it's really hard at the end, they're just like, all right, let's get this over with. And because they, they understand that there are retakes now and they sort of have been through the process a lot. So yeah, stress does reduce. Let's get Ben one more round. So again, my name's uh, Kyle Johnson. I'm a professor here in uh, electrical and computer engineering. I know a lot of you all know me, but I do see uh, a lot of new faces, which is really cool. Um, you can of course see that I'm wearing a virtual reality headset right now. Um, in a minute here, AJ is gonna join me in VR. Uh, AJ is an undergraduate student, actually a recent award winner of our Academic Excellence Award in uh, Computer Systems Engineering. Not the first time people are going to be clapping for you, AJ. Uh, so he's graduating this, uh, this semester. I'm really sorry to lose him because he's been working with me since he was a freshman, which is really amazing. Um, so uh, actually in 2019, uh, his paper at ASEE won a best paper award in uh, the computing and education division. So uh, really sad to lose. I'm actually cheering up because I'm losing AJ. Um, but yeah, no, yeah, yeah, please hold all the applause until the end for AJ. Uh, this is really all um, his work, honestly. Um, you know, a lot of this has been uh, partnerships with faculty here. So Sid's here, Sid's been my collaborator on this project since the beginning. Um, and uh, now we've added um, a few folks. So Dominique's been involved a little bit, Nathaniel's been involved a little bit with this. Um, and also uh, Nandana Wellawiria in, uh, in physics now with this latest version. Uh, and so a lot of people uh, have been involved with this project. It's in a pretty mature state, as you'll see. Uh, hopefully you'll see. Um, this doesn't do it justice. It runs a lot better than what you're gonna see as I'm screen sharing a screen share through Zoom. It's got a few compression artifacts, but if you wanna see it in person, there'll be time for that uh, if you wanna try it. Um, so again, what I'm wearing right now is a virtual reality headset. It's actually a mixed reality headset. Um, I could illustrate that, I believe. So if I think if I double tap it or something, anyway, if I walk out of the boundary, um, it should show you all that I've left the boundary. Yeah, so it's a mixed reality headset. I can see the real world. It's in black and white, but it's not too bad. It's actually, I think, a good compromise between sort of focusing on the virtual uh, and focusing on the real. So again, a little bit of history on this project. Uh, we started this out as a fully virtual reality system. And uh, you can see I'm holding this graphics tablet here. Um, and the idea was, let's try to have students solve uh, engineering statics problems in 3D environments. And if they're gonna do that in the 3D environment, they need some tool that they can solve the problems with. And so we added this graphics tablet so that they could write and draw. And then we were thinking, well, wouldn't it be cool if they could do that with other people? Um, at a distance, and so we had the ability to collaborate with others. Um, but along the way, so that was the project that AJ won his best paper award uh, for back in 2019. But along the way, we started thinking, well, you know, the value of this graphics tablet is actually a little bit, or in the headset, is a little bit beyond um, the 3D. It actually creates a uniform environment for everybody. You put on this headset, and everybody gets the same exact experience, right? You're in the same environment with the same information. And so um, just this last year, we set out to build a general purpose problem solving environment in VR that we could deliver conventional materials through and have people solve conventional problems in the conventional way, but while wearing a VR headset. Um, and so I'm going to show you a little demonstration because I think it'll make a little bit more sense as I do that. And we can discuss the individual little features of it and whatnot. Hopefully it all works flawlessly like it's been for our study that we're running right now. Um, I'm lying, of course, we've had a little technical glitches. But all right, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to use this controller here, which is not really necessary other than for uh, being a little quicker in the interface. And so I'm launching this application we call Vertio. It's a play on words uh, for video. As you'll we'll see, vertigo, you might get vertigo. Um, and so I actually launched into this environment that we call Vertio, a VR video learning environment. And I wanted to make sure it's looking okay up there. Okay, so you can see I launched into, um, into mixed reality, right? So I can still kind of see you all, which is great. Um, this is underappreciated, honestly, that um, when you launch into pure VR, you lose that attachment to the real world. You don't know if somebody's walked in the room, uh, you don't know if you're about to trip over something. And so, yeah, this isn't a very high fidelity view, but it gives me great comfort. 
and I can still sort of ignore the real world. I can turn it off if I want. So on my graphics tablet, which I can see because I'm in mixed reality, I can hit a button and I can go into pure VR if I want to. So if I want to hide, hide that, I can. But what's really cool about this environment is that I have the ability to write and draw. And so over on this screen over here, which is just sort of a, a tutorial, if you will, a, you know, a loading screen, I can draw figures. So I can say, hi. Um, right, I can circle something. Oops, I accidentally clicked the button. I can change my colors. Right. I can change my line widths. This is a fully featured drawing environment. I can undo, very important feature. Any graphics application should have undo. I can erase all of it, right? It's a drawing environment, okay? But it's also this really cool educational environment. Because what we've done is we've embedded the ability to put videos in here. And so there's the, the person we all know and love, Sid Savadati. Um, and he's going to give a video lecture. And we're going to watch all 21 minutes of this today. In this video, we will learn how to identify zero is there sound, John? in traffic. Consider this particular truck, which is supported by. Okay. Anyway, pretend you can hear it. Sid can overlay. just actually give you an overlay of what he, you know, he can just speak out loud. Load as shown here. And so he's showing me on there all the zero force members how to find the zero force members of the trust. And we've got a video here, and it's actually forcing me to watch the video. I can go back, but I can't go forward. And at the same time, I get the same note page that he's working on, and I can follow along. Several hundred members. Okay? So as he's drawing and circling the zero force members, no force within them right? under a given then I can follow along as he's doing that. For engineers to be um, able to identify but these members, members which have this is only part of the story. The real value of this application and value of this technology is that we can gather a tremendous amount of data in incredible accuracy. We know exactly where they're putting their pen at every point in time during the video. The first step in now, the really, really cool thing to draw the that I hope everyone in here is excited about, the truck. because I'm most excited about this. This is where the innovation is going to come, and I already have a is that I can turn on eye tracking. Go ahead and, draw the free body and this isn't calibrated for me, so I've kind of failed a little bit, but I should do the calibration. We show the but it's showing me where I'm looking. Found acting vertically downward. Then, in order to complete the free body diagram of this, we have to separate this truck from all its supports or surroundings. It should be showing you. You see the blue dot? In this case, the surroundings or supports are the pin at a. I am seeing it, but you don't have to show that. It's tracking it regardless of whether or not it's shown. And we have to show all the reactions at these supports. So the pin at a resists. So we have the ability to deliver forces. not just 3D environments, which of course we can. We can deliver 2D videos where we know exactly where the so student's looking, exactly how they're responding to it in terms of taking notes, and where they're looking on their page while they're solving the problem. So if they're going back and forth to the diagram, if they're focusing on the wrong things. But wait, there's more. AJ is now going to join me in this environment, and so we can actually interact together. You separate the joint at a from all its surroundings, show the forces in the members, and then apply equations of equilibrium to find out. Hopefully, AJ is going to join me. <laughs> I know. This is like the statics uh, showcase. Oh. AJ is just setting up his environment. Are you in here, AJ? We should have rehearsed this a little bit more so he instantly popped in. So right now, um, what we're doing with this is uh, we're running a study to collect data on students solving statics problems. This is the, the, the where this is going. So originally my, my thoughts around this were, we're gonna develop new statics learning environments where everyone's gonna learn statics a different way. But I think that the, and, and originally we were sort of, okay, yes, let's solve textbook problems, right? And then give people that three-dimensional feel for them. But the original system was, um, was actually pretty hard to deploy and use. They used desktop headsets, didn't have this eye tracking thing. 
this latest version is actually compatible with almost everything we currently do. For better or for worse, we can also do the other cool new things. But we can study how people learn with, with video content. Uh, we could do live. We're not doing live right now, but we could do live content. And study how people learn together and communicate together, as we'll see as soon as AJ gets in here. Are you there, AJ? Yeah, let me do that. Like I said, we're uh, still running into some technical hurdles. Single player experience is excellent. <laughs> uh, I think I see him. So he's that yellow dot in the bottom here. Um, it's a little hard to see. I'll kind of go over here. AJ can, there you go. <laughs> so this is surprisingly cool. AJ and I have had many meetings uh, within the software. So we'll actually meet together rather than on Zoom. We'll meet in here. Um, and this idea of um, communicating through writing, which we do very naturally on whiteboards and things like that, just happens automatically in virtual reality uh, at a distance. And so our current experiences with Zoom and whatnot are very like one-sided affairs. They're not very collaborative affairs. Uh, you can kind of get around this and we can have any number of people join. Um, we can also have them join with video, although it's kind of less exciting. So normally what we do, we turn it off for the study uh, but we put a little um, uh, a little icon underneath each board saying where somebody is, uh, and so if AJ is over here with me, both of our um, both of our avatar photos would appear on below that board, and we can have any number of these boards, and really any number of people in here that you're communicating with, and so you could have, in theory, you know, 30, 40 people all inside the same environment on different whiteboards, all interacting and drawing and and talking uh, and watching videos together. The videos, by the way, are, are completely synchronized. AJ can start the video. So basically, AJ is having the very same effect we have at the moment. We are doing Exactly. Zero. So AJ is in, in, it's like we're in the same room and that's, that's something that we really um, strive for. <laughs> it's, like, it's like we're here. <laughs> Um, and, and this is, can be work out a, he could be in another country right now and this would work identically. And you wouldn't even recognize if he makes fun of the video and like drawing, drawing stuff on Sid's face. Yes, he is drawing things on Sid's face. I see that now. I do that often actually, sorry, Sid. Um, constantly like, ah. Uh... <laughs> the video annotating is a little controversial. Um... <laughs> It's a really cool feature, by the way, that we're not exploiting just right now, but um, the annotations stay at that point in the video. So you can actually annotate a full like, you know, 30 minute video. Um, so if you were to want to work on to, with somebody on creating an educational video, you could actually use this system to make notes on, mark on, things like that. Um, and so the, the big thing of, of like all the stuff that we're doing is we're building a platform to do educational research. We don't actually intend for students to use this, as, it can definitely be used as a problem solving environment. But I mean, these headsets are expensive, right? Um, not everybody has one, they're gonna have to come to a facility to use them. The real value I think in here is studying how students learn, right? Um, how students learn collaboratively, how they learn from video content, eventually how they learn from 3D content. So then I have a number of other things going on with, you know, excavators and uh, you know 3D things basically where you're modeling that 3D uh, geometry, but then modeling it on, on 2D paper, right? Um, and then also again, working with each other. But we can learn a lot about how students uh, you know, watch video, what they attend to, and then how they, um, how they go about solving problems based on that activity. Uh, so this is where we're at right now. Um, build it. We have the, 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 the system largely built and working. We have um, all the data being collected. And so this all goes into giant spreadsheets, basically, like literally 90 times a second, we're getting their eye tracking data. Hundreds of times a second, we're getting their pen tracking data. Um, and then we're getting that all tagged with exact moments of video that they're at. Um, and the next phase of this is really going to be, okay, so what? Right, um, and honestly, I'm relying a little bit on, on everyone else here for the so what. We think this is really cool. This originates from uh, you know, collaborations with Sid uh, and Nandana over in physics, right? Uh, to try to say, okay, yes, this system is useful, right? I mean, it, in 
sort of has implicit use in terms of gathering consistent data. So if you just wanna know how students solve problems where they all are literally experiencing the exact same thing, it has value. If you wanna go into more depth and use the eye tracking data, right? Now we have some additional innovation that I think that we can get a lot of, a lot of publications out of, but hopefully uh, more importantly, learn a lot more about what's um, confusing, what's useful in the content that we are preparing for our students. And so I think this has general use outside of engineering. I'm particularly excited about it for engineering, math, physics, you know, these fields that are very drawing, right? Problem solving focused. We don't really know a lot about the, the dynamic nature of these things because it's extremely hard to collect that data, right? It's extremely hard to collect the process by which students solve a problem uh, in a way that is uh, immediately analyzable, right? So how do you do it? You collect it with video, but then you're gonna go back and like trace all of the paths that they follow and stuff, right? Almost impossible and try doing that across, you know, 20 students at the same time. So we have um, just a, Give you a sense that we can do this at some level of scale. We have 14 of these headsets. So they can all be linked together in the same environment. And so I don't think that we're ever going to do 14. I think that the ideal number for this is like four or five kind of small groups. Um, but that's where we're going next with this. Right now we're studying, okay, what is there when, when we have a group of students and we're having really everyone in SIDS statics class go through this and solve this problem. This is embedded into his course at an appropriate time and going to be, the students are, that are, are solving this are, are, it's set at a time in the course when they should learn this material, right? The ones that we've seen so far are SIDS graders um, and the output of this, which we literally just collected it. I wish I had to show it to you. I've looked a little bit at it. Um, there, it's very elaborate solutions. It's not like they're not participating. They're going through their take. I was actually surprised. I kind of expected them to watch the video and not take notes alongside. No, they're actually going through and following along with what Sid's doing in the video, which is really cool to see. Um, the eye tracking data looks spot on. Um, and then they go and they solve the problem. And the solutions are very elaborate. Uh, we were concerned with people um, using these tablets, like that this would be a very unfamiliar thing because you're not drawing and looking at the thing, right? Uh, but it, people seem to use them no problem. Um, so I was very pleasantly surprised at that so far. Um, people adapt to this interface very quickly. I mean, professional artists use this. This is what they use. There's some value because you're not being blocked by the pen. So you can just see exactly where you're drawing. So you can be much more precise at some level. And so that's pretty much the, the demo. I wanna thank AJ again for helping set all this up and Sid. Well, there you go. And uh, yeah, take some questions on, on the system. Yeah. I think this is actually really cool. And I think that one of, besides all that you have said, is the fact that it keeps students focused because they know that they have to keep track. Yeah. It's not, they're not having to have stress group, they're having to just focus and watch it. They know that they're still going to be. Yeah, and they're not being video recorded. There's this weird thing, I think, when you point a video camera at somebody, but when you put them inside a virtual reality environment, there's no sense of like, oh, I'm being like, it's not creepy, if that makes sense. Yeah, the eye track is pretty creepy. Yeah, no, we are tracking a lot of things. Um, we don't have it enabled, but uh, the plan is to be able to um, have microphone recording as well. So uh, right now, Steve Pano, who's the uh, engineering education uh, fellow uh, for this, this year, uh, is, uh, is working with this study and doing think alouds. He's recording on a microphone uh, right now, but in theory, we could record all the audio data as well that students are uh, saying. This again, purely for research. And so this is very upfront with them that you're doing this. You can enable or disable. Do you monitor the data or? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Not, not directly off the headsets probably, although I've seen some really cool work where you can literally like pick up what somebody's saying in the room based on the vibrations of a virtual reality headset, it's super creepy. Um, like essentially using the motion tracking, which is so precise in here to pick up vibrations. It's nuts. Um, and so yes, probably you could get heart rate um, directly off the headset, but you could also give them an Apple watch or something like that and get the heart rate from that. That's also very, quite viable. You know, tracking EEG and stuff like that is also possible. So uh, you, I, I don't put a whole lot of stock in that sort of data. Um, it tends to be extremely noisy. And so I think you'd have to collect that across large swaths of the population. Uh, it also just, 
yeah, it, it tends to be very, very difficult data to analyze. I'm more excited about the eye tracking data. Well, that was a thing. You mean you can take it away Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, th this headset's not capable of it, but um, one of the better indicators of stress is pupil size. Um, and so you can use that in theory in later generations of these headsets. Some of them have it already where you can get much better indicate, like physiological indicators, um, including heart rate. So there are headsets that also support that. Can you replicate the same system with a regular laptop? I mean, you can analyze it. It's a great point. Uh, it's something I've been thinking about a, a lot. Um, so the difficult part is, is the eye tracking, honestly. Um, those desktop based headsets tend to be a lot less reliable than something that's mounted to your, your head. They require a lot more calibration. They can still be quite good. Um, I think that uh, the value of this though is the standardization. So I can give you somebody the exact same experience, whether they're here or anywhere else on earth. It's not dependent on something that your particular laptop at a particular screen size, right? We have ex the exact same hardware and somebody who buys this same hardware somewhere else on earth would also have the exact same experience. I think that's a, a lot of value, but long-term of course, we wanna bring in the 3D into the experience. And so I think this is a good starting point, but I appreciate what you're saying. And uh, we've definitely thought about that as well, that it is possible to build this on a, uh, a 2D monitor with a graphics tablet, it would be largely the same. You get a little less um, easy screen real estate, if that makes sense. Um, and so we can have big screens and 10 of them if we want to all around us that we kind of use our body to look at, which would be hard in a desktop. You'd have to give them some interface to like swing around and things like that. And that might be a little bit painful, but you're absolutely right. Um, and, I, yeah. and, and I think um, just to give you some other ideas of people that might be interested, I can see like any screen can be uh, interested in productivity. Yeah. Uh, like, because like they, people, you can measure what people do on computers, but also like how engaged they are on their eyes, and their mouse movement, or like hand, yeah. hand right? Uh, and that I can see how many in different positions, depending on the industry that is computer based, people will be like super yeah. interested controlling those factors. I'm with you 100%. I, I think that, yes, this was you know born as an engineering education project, but I think going to engineering practice, it makes a lot of sense. Um, we can bring in desktops as well, like, so you can use your computer inside of this experience. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of value in that. These headsets are really going to be the future, um, and maybe not exactly like this. This is an early stage version, but the augmented reality headsets that are starting to come on the market, starting to become a little bit more widespread, but we'll be able to replicate anything that you want essentially. Uh, so if you want to have a drawing surface, you'll have that. If you want to have a computer screen, you'll have that. If you wanna have a tablet in your hand, you'll have that. Um, and so I see this as um, a stepping stone towards where we're actually going to end up and what everybody's going to have available to them. You know, are we all gonna be walking around wearing headsets? I don't know, probably not, um, not until they get extremely light, but as far as sitting at our desk working, there's a good chance that that's gonna happen. So. Um, you, we, you mentioned the desktop earlier. I actually think the desktop is, is very much going to be the past. And this kind of system is going to be the future where we can put a big screen up so, if we want so to. So what about like, uh, like the feasible data, right? Like I have this problem with my wife yesterday actually, that she was having issues with the regular two big screens that she has to do all the analytics of data yeah. that she has to do. So with these, you have so much screen so can you actually have like a lot of data? You can have you can a see ton. The of three screens as you can see on the desktop, so you can be more Yeah, active. you are limited by the processing power. So there's no desktop, by the way, this is it. This is a completely self-contained system. Um, so you are limited by the fact that this is basically a mobile phone. But there are headsets that, this headset actually can be connected to a computer and driven by the computer. And in that case, you could have a hundred displays if you wanted to at arbitrary size with arbitrary content on it. There are limits, of course, as there are with any system, but this one in particular would struggle with, you know, we could probably put five, six, maybe 10 displays up, um, but you'd be limited in the amount of memory they have, processing power on device. 
Um, but yes, you could do a lot with a desktop headset or a desktop that's connected to this headset.